Welcome. Thank you for being here. I can feel that everyone here, this is an important topic to you. I can feel that you all want to be part of something. And being here tonight is just the start. The way this evening will go is I'll facilitate the meeting. I'm the executive director of the Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecology Center. My name is Pam Cundy. I'm new to the community. I moved here in August. Though I've been coming here for four years. Many of you have been here many, many years longer, and this is a really dear subject to you. And I hope that I can treat it with the respect that it deserves as I facilitate the meeting. If we do go off on a tangent because of the limited time, I'd ask for your permission for me to be able to get us back on track. And I hope that I don't offend anybody. No, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Because if we can stay on track, we will accomplish so much more. Though you have really strong, passionate feelings about being here and about the thoughts that you have, the person next to you may have some opposing thoughts. The whole idea is that we can get thoughts out and start communication going so that we can be effective working together, because that's the only way we're going to pull this off. So. The way that today will go, this evening will go, is we actually have Marilyn Lincoln from the state parks here. She's going to come up and bring us right up to date at where we are at. That will alter the information that we have to give you for the rest of the program. We've, we've got everything. This was just finished at 4.15 today, the information you've been handed. That's as current as we know. We know it's going to change from the information we have here. The next person who will come up is Joe Worth. He's going to explain to you how the Trails Association has an idea and a concept that's really worth listening to. Then we'll have Steve Hill, who is a retired parks employee. In fact, you were a superintendent, weren't you? I was. So his knowledge is amazing, but he comes to us as an educator with an idea of how we could use this space to transform not only the educational environment in our community, but help train our young people to be effective and to find careers. And then I'll come back up and I'll let you know what the next steps are. In the information that's been handed out, we have a list of the committees that will need to be formed. And from there, hopefully, we will break into some committees and find a person who will be the leader of those committee, committees. Now, leader to me is a person who creates the space for everyone else to be a hero. So the leader of a committee would be the person who could facilitate everybody else's abilities, not just drive their own point home. So we really want you to think about that if, if you're going to step up into a leadership role. <coughs> From there, we will mobilize this community and we'll accomplish this, because there is no other option. So at this time, Marilyn, would you come up and bring us up to speed? Thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate everybody coming out with the State Park Open. That's what we're here with, and that's what we're all about. Um, so let me just kind of give you where we're at right now. Um, July 1st, 2012, the park closes. Um, that's 70 parks statewide, some of them are off the closure list due to groups that have come forward and have able to come into agreements by a donation agreement or a concession agreement or some kind of funding that's going to keep some of these closed parks open. But most of them are still on that list and are scheduled to close July 1st. As you can see, it's closed right now. Um, that is just due to um, saving money this fiscal year. The state's fiscal year runs from July 1st through um, June 30th. That's the state's fiscal year. So in order for us to save money this year, this fiscal year in our budget, we closed the campground. I think it was sometime around November or so. We closed the campground. And Davies closed just right before Thanksgiving so that we could save some money on some costs um, for this fiscal year. There is no intention to open the campground um, just from May to July. We don't intend to open the campground, but we do intend to open days um, as soon as the, we can get up. And the, this year it might be early because there is no snow on the ground. But as soon as it's safe to get up to the Vista Point parking lot, we'll open the days until July 1st, and at that time it will close. 
unless we find someone that will operate the park. Um, there will be, uh, there's three different kinds of agreements. There's something that we call a donor agreement where money is given to the state to operate the park and we charge our services to that account. It doesn't go to Sacramento, it stays local, it supports the park that it, it's, it goes to. So we charge directly to that account and that's called a donor agreement. So if it costs, I'm just going to throw out, let's say it costs $250,000 from Castle Craig State Park and the community can raise that kind of money, the park will stay open and we charge it to that account. So that's one way. There's something that we call an operating agreement. Um, it can be a nonprofit or it can be a governmental agency and they can come in and operate the park. It doesn't go out for bid. They just submit a proposal on how they're going to do it so that we know financially and what that they can actually run that park. That's called an operating agreement. And then there's something called a concession agreement. And that is for more of a for-profit type of a business that will come in and operate a park. It's called a concession agreement. It's usually a for-profit type of entity. Um, for instance, if you're familiar with Bernie Falls, the cabins, the camp store, is run by Recreation Resource Management. They run that portion of Bernie Falls under what we call a concession agreement. The state gets a portion of their, their gross profits and percentage is how it usually works. So we, we, make, we, we make money with the concession agreement. And this particular part will be going out for a concession agreement. It's what we call a request for a proposal. It's going to go out and anybody that has a business of some sort can put a proposal in on how they think they want to operate this park. And then we have a checklist and we evaluate it and we find out whether that they can operate it or not <coughs> and are they going to operate the entire park or portion of the park. Generally a for-profit will just want to run the revenue side of a park. They're not going to want to do all the rest of the stuff in the back country. And so we don't know yet what kind of proposals are going to come in. But from the people I've talked to, they're, they're more interested in running a portion of it, not the whole thing. Although that's what we'd like. But that may not be reality in order to keep it open. So I, my understanding is where you are tonight is that uh, the direction, the, the overall direction that, that um, Pam asked me to talk about is that We've been told that don't rely on general funds money. The state is broke. We all know that. We read it in the paper every day. <coughs> don't rely on any more general fund. And we have what we call a uh, state park um, revolving fund, which is where our, all of the revenue we collect goes into this fund. But it's not enough to run the whole system. So we, we tap this fund where we make revenue, and then we get money from the governor from what we call the general fund. So we get a portion of what the revenue that we collect comes back to parks, and then we have a portion that comes from the state, from taxpayers basically, from all of us, to operate these parks. Well, this is going away. This general fund's going away. Much like all the school districts, et cetera, et cetera, there's not much to support us anymore. So we've been told, make your park self-sustainable. Then the communities that are in these parks, can you, the community, step forward and keep these parks open in one manner or another. This is not to operate like we operate it. But how can we keep these parks open? Because they're treasures and they're for us to use. They're, they're public property. And how do we keep them open? So, um, so that leads me to, I'll give an example of what happened at the Bidwell Mansion. We started this process at the back in the fall, last fall. Um, letters were written. Um, to the legislatures from our association, the Midwell Mansion Association and community, saying you got to keep the mansion open. It's important to the history of California. Well, that got Senator Lamalfa, uh, you know, concerned about this community in Chico. He called the town meeting and said, "Okay, community, the state can't bail you out. You, the community, have to raise funds to keep the mansion open if you want the mansion open." That in turn formed a, a, a group of people that came together and they called themselves the Bidwell Mansion Community Project. They're not an organization, they're not a nonprofit, they're just members of the community that have come together to raise enough money to keep that park open. And so we've worked closely with them, with them to figure out what is that cost, what is that figure to keep the mansion open, and are we talking about two day a week, one day a week, five days a week, school groups, no school groups, you know, what's the vision? of how you want that park to be. So we did come down and we figured out they need to raise $100,000. 
and with that, I'm, they were going to take out a campaign going to raise $100,000 in 90 days is what their goal was. So they've got fundraisers going on. They've got people just sending checks in. Um, they're, they've set up an account through the North Valley Community Foundation since they're not an entity. They formed they, under that, and I think you have something called the Shasta Regional Community Foundation that you can do this with. Um, they, I think they charge 1% or 2% for an ad. But that way, anybody that donates it, it's a tax write. So they're, and they, have one, they have one major fundraiser coming up, and that is um, a, a fun run, fun run walk that they're expecting to make $50,000 on. Um, but they have other fundraisers that are going on. At the same time that they're raising money, we're raising money too. The state's raising money as well. We just did a New Year's Eve in the mansion kind of a thing going on. So we're, the state's also moving forward to raise money. So between us and them, and we're working together to raise a total of 175,000 is what's gonna keep that mansion open three days a week for next fiscal year, for fiscal year 12, 13. Now we have, we have a couple more years to go. This is not something that magically is gonna disappear. We gotta, we gotta look to the future and we're changing the way we think in parks. We're thinking more revenue generation now because we have to be self-sustained. So that's just an example of what you can do as a community, and I think that's the direction that you may want to go tonight. Um, they, the Bidwell Mansion Community Project has a finance committee going that I'm a member of and I work with, and we're doing all the number thing. We have a fundraising committee that are doing the fundraising thing, and they're hoping by April 1st to have that 100,000 and then go into kind of a donor agreement with us about how that money comes over to us and how we're going to keep it in general. So that's kind of where we're at with that. As far as Castle Crags, um, we do have some numbers um, that we've been playing with and trying to figure out how can we keep this, this, this uh, park open. Back in 2008-9, when we originally thought, how much can we save by closing it? Back then, we were running to operate Castle Crags under the state operation was about $306,000. $306, is what we operate, and we only would bring in 136,000 in revenue. So you can do the math, and you can see how much you could save by closing this park. Um, now there are some expenses of taking care of a closed park too. You can't just shut down and walk away. There are still some responsibilities we have in a closed park, so there are some costs to closure. But you could save quite a bit by closing that park by these numbers. Now, since 2008-09, um, Heidi Horvitz, who's sitting in the back of the room here, she's the sector superintendent. She's pulled together some numbers. Uh, we've been, we've been, you know, going down and down and down on trying to get our costs down to run the park, and so we come up with about 215,000 now to operate the park year. -round. And then those numbers could even drop even farther down if we're only looking at maybe a Memorial Day to Labor Day kind of operation, because that's what it used to be. That's correct. It used to be a season. Park. We don't make any money in the, in the, in the, in the winter there, you know, they, we just don't have the visitation. Uh, we have a visitation for you folks that still do the skiing and the snowshoeing and the hiking and, you know, those kind of visitors, but the money part of the visitation doesn't come but in those few months. So we can look at a seasonal operation, which is kind of what's going on right now with the, with the gate close. People are still able to hike the trails. You can still get in and hike. We just don't have the facilities. So. Um, that's what I would recommend if, for you as a community if you want to get together and start working toward a goal, work with us and see what these numbers are to keep it open. You decide what open might be and we can work with you on that. So I didn't see 278, but that, I think it just went to nine. Nine, 279, we just had another park. California. California. In California, oh, that's, that's the California state park, 279. So 70 leaves us with 209 parks open. In California? Ooh. Anybody know that? What was it? How many federal parks in California? I'm going to guess around a dozen. So, do we have any more questions for Marilyn concerning the information she has about the park? So, Marilyn and Heidi are going to stay. And the reason they're going to stay, we spoke earlier, is they really want to be a part of this solution. They want to work with us. And if you were um, able to be at the last meeting, Brett, what is Brett's last name? Missouri. Brett Missouri, who's um, actually at the park here, he wants to work with us too because it's not his job he's protecting. It is that park that he loves so much. 
Next, we'll hear from Joe Word from the Trails Association. And so, Joe, you right. to Thank you. Well, I'm going to bring you up to date on what the uh, Trail Association has been uh, doing with regard to Castle Springs for about eight or nine months now, and, uh, and give you some thoughts about how, how I think we can go forward. Um, it was, it's very clear uh, to us in the Trail Association that Castle Springs is important to this community. Uh, it's important for, you know, for at least a couple of reasons. One of them is economic. Um, a park like Castle Craig's uh, brings people in who spend money locally, and uh, you can argue about how much, what, what are the actual dollar values, uh, you know, it depends on you know, what, what kind of number you choose from, but it, it certainly is in the hundreds of thousands for this area, for, you know, perhaps if you use some numbers up to as much as a million in this area. And so that will go away at a time when the, the up in South County, uh, are, are experiencing economic difficulties. So it's a lot. This is a net loss for the communities in South County. Um, a second, a second reason is is the value that the Castle Craigs brings to the quality of life here. Uh, the scenery, scenery in the park, the trails in the park, are uh, are part of, are part of this scene, and uh, it's they add to the quality of life that we all enjoy here, <coughs> and that bring visitors here. And so it's easy to conclude that us as individuals and as organizations of this new community need to come together and to find ways to keep the park open. I think it is very important. So what, what has the Trail Association been doing? For about the past um, eight or nine months, or maybe a bit longer than that, uh, we've been uh, meeting with uh, Marilyn, Heidi, and Brett, um, and also with the Castle Springs Interpretive Association. Uh, to talk about some of the numbers that are involved in operating the park and to look at options as to what we might do about that and then to try to determine what role the Trail Association would play in keeping the park uh, in operation. Uh, it was very, very clear that we do not have, the Trail Association does not have the skills or the resources to operate all of the park. And that's really, that's not what we do. <laughs> it's not what we can do. What we can do, however, is, is we can work on the trails in the park. That, that is what we do. And we can assist on keeping the trails uh, accessible and keeping them in good condition uh, so that they are usable to people. And what, it, what has happened with regard to that, that kind of activity uh, is a couple of things. One is uh, at the end of uh, 2011, uh, the Castle Franks Interpretive Association, which has which has served that park for almost 20 years. And uh, we owe them an enormous vote of thanks for the, for the work that, that Rob Menzies and Tom Johnson and, and the others uh, have, have put into that park and what they've done for that park. Their contract expired at the end of 2011 with the state. And so the, some of the money that they have accumulated over the years has been transferred to the Trail Association, put in a separate account, and earmarked only for Castle Craigs. And then um, you know, we will work with state parks to determine uh, what, how the money is spent on, or what particular projects would you spend the money on. And the other thing that, that we've been done is we've been talking with state parks you know, for some months now about an agreement that will allow us to work on, on the trails in the park. And on Monday, I signed that agreement. Um, and we went back and forth a lot on, on various aspects of the agreement, but this, this is one that we can sign. It will let us work in the park, and, and that is what we intend to do. And part of that agreement also included a series of projects uh, that we will be working on in the park get beginning this spring. So we can do that part of it. That's not, however, the whole story, of course. The, the uh, operating the, the front, front entrance, collecting the fees, operating the campground is not something we can do. We can do the trails. And we're going to get the um, How do we go First forward? First of all, Joe, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to, want to thank again Rob Menzies and Tom Johnson from the Castle Craigs and Turkey Association for the job that they've done over, over two decades in that park. Um, the Trail Association view our options 
thesis is this. Um, by far, the most desirable option for the park will be to find a way for the state to continue to operate. You know, this, the expertise, the experience is there. Uh, the responsibility for the facilities of the land is there with the state. And if a way can be found to, to narrow the gap between revenue and costs, then maybe we can find a way to handle that. And i uh, talked to Marilyn, I'm, I'm not going to put the numbers, but I'm not sure if she's ready to hear such numbers, but they've been working on how, the, she and Heidi have been working on how to narrow that gap. And it sounded like it was getting fairly close to something we might be able to handle. So I think that is by far the most uh, desirable option and one that we, that we know will work if we can manage to deal with that gap between revenues and costs. And I, and I think it's getting close enough that we, we can seriously entertain that idea. A second option is one that is, is possible to do in the available time, uh, but I think less desirable than the first, and that is a three-way partnership. With a concessionaire, the state has to be involved because the state has responsibilities. They cannot walk away from the facilities, the land, and, and then a, a local nonprofit like the Trail Association. We, look, we work on the trails, concessionaire rockers, the campground, the front gate. The things like major maintenance uh, has to be a state responsibility because that could be substantial costs that, that nobody else could bear. So I think that is that is a, a doable relationship that could be could be done uh, and and have it in place before the first of July. Is that it? That's kind of as I understand that's our drop dead day, and uh, we would like not to drop dead. So, <laughs> so anyway, so that that's our view. Is that the, those two options are are how we can go forward, and I think both of them are viable, but with the the state operating it with a with a tremendous amount of community involvement uh, is, is the way forward. And I think it's clear that from what Maryland said, and, and also when we've looked at the numbers, that the model that the state has used to operate this park, and, and parks in general, is no longer viable. You have to find a new model for operation of parks, but we have to find a model. Because as Pat Cam said, uh, this is, we cannot afford to fail in this. It costs, it costs our communities too much. Uh, you know, in terms of quality of life and, and in terms of economic benefits to uh, see this park close. So I think we really need to come together and do all we can to keep it open. And, I, and I, it looks to me like it is, it's doable. It is doable. So, uh, so that, that's where we are.